My book, Mountains Beyond Mountains, really began when I ran into Dr. Paul Farmer by accident in Haiti. Uh, and Strength in What Remains began in much the same way when I met uh, Dale on a visit to Paul Farmer. In both cases, I was interested initially, not in the issues that interested those men, but in the outlines of their lives, which seemed eminently suited to storytelling. I, I do know that uh, Strength in What's, What Remains is not about Africa. Conceived by so many of us Americans as one vast dysfunctional country. I know that I didn't want to make Burundi seem exotic, I wanted to make it comprehensible. We hear about mass slaughter uh, in distant countries and we imagine that murder and mayhem define those locales. Um, I hoped Deo's story would humanize our view of Burundi and also open up that part of New York that seems designed to be invisible, the service entrances of the Upper East Side the camping sites in Central Park. And this clinic was a pile of rocks when I first visited the site with Deo in the summer of 2006. By the fall of 2008, um, it was a, a real facility providing food to the hungriest people in the area and clean water to all of them. And it was also a medical center which in its first year and a half of operation treated 28,000 different patients, most of them for free. There, there was and still is nothing like that operation elsewhere in Burundi. People come there for help from all over the country. Uh, some patients come on week-long treks from other countries <laughs> to the Congo and Tanzania. And some visitors have come not for medical help but only to look at the clinic. When Deo asked one of these people why he come and then applied to see America. <laughs> Deo told this story. This past summer we needed some help to make a road that goes to our site passable. A friend of mine told me, well Deo, there's a great Belgian construction company that builds roads in Burundi and Rwanda and the Congo. And I was so excited. So I went to talk to the representative of the company. He sent someone to look at the road and estimated a cost of at least 50,000 US dollars. Not to pave the road, but just to widen it and make it passable. I went back frustrated, wondering how to tell the Kabutu community this bad news. As I was explaining this to them, one woman with a baby crying on her back said to me, you will not pay a penny for this road. You become so much sick because we are poor, but we are not poor because we are lazy. We will work on this road with our own hands. The next day, 166 people showed up with pickaxes, hoes, machetes, and other tools. One of the volunteers was a woman who came to work with a sick child. When a friend of mine and I looked at the baby, we saw that the baby was sweating. I then asked the mother why she came to work with a child that sick, and she said to me, well, I've already lost three children and I know this one is next, whether I stay at home or come to work here, so it's better for me to join others and make my contribution, which hopefully will help to save someone else's child who will be sick but alive when you have a clinic in Kibutu. The entire road, six kilometers long, was rebuilt by these people with machetes and hoes. The same day the road was finished, a representative of the Belgian road construction company called me to negotiate the price. You can imagine how I felt to get that call from him. I said to him, thank you so much for your call, but it's already done. He was obvious, shocked, he said to me, what do you mean, who did it? We are the only road construction company in the entire region. And I said, not anymore. <laughs>